Jared here from The Hunt and Fool, and in today's video, I'm gonna give away some secrets. Mm. Over the last 13 years, I have been e-scouting and learning a lot through the process and also taking advantage of an ever-evolving tool set that has become available to us over time. In today's session, I'm gonna teach you how to put together a virtual hunt plan using three primary tool sets. Number one, we're gonna use Hunt and Fool's brand new proprietary digital 3D mapping platform that's complete with hunt filtering and waypoint management. We're also gonna rely on one of my old time personal favorites, Google Earth. And finally, some free resources from the Forest Service that helps you understand what your travel restrictions might be on any given hunt. Now, when it comes to an e-scouting plan, there's basically five main points that I put together on every single time. Number one, we're gonna look at unit selection. I gotta figure out where I wanna go hunting. Number two, we're gonna look at habitat, topography, bedding, food, cover, etc. We're gonna look at access, a super important piece of the pie. We're also gonna look at glassing and listening points. Again, we're talking about an archery elk hunt here, so we're gonna need to have audio on these bugling bulls. And finally, one that's often overlooked is like your personal impact plan. How am I gonna get in and out, and if necessary, camp in this backcountry experience without becoming my own worst enemy and scaring off all my elk? So with that said, we'll dive right into step one, and that's unit selection. When it comes to unit selection, there's a pile of resources available. You've got free sources like wildlife biologists from the state, um, forums, online um, communities where you can do research. And then you've also have paid services like Hunt and Fool where you can help, uh, where we can help you plan and execute your hunts for you. In this particular case, I'm gonna focus on Hunt and Fool's new filtering system that basically takes 25 years worth of Hunt and Fool's research and dumps it into a 3D digital mapping platform, giving you an opportunity to research hunts by putting in preferences that'll meet the expectations you have when you head into the field in the fall. To start the hunt filtering process, I'm gonna click on the Find a Hunt filter on the Hunt and Fool map. Then in this particular case, again, I'm gonna be looking for an archery elk hunt. So I'm gonna select Rocky Mountain Elk. I'm gonna select either sex because I know that in Colorado, these hunts are either sex hunts. Archery, and then I'm gonna use the trophy potential slider to be a little bit greedy here. And I'm gonna look for a th hunts that Hunt and Fool believes will provide an opportunity at a 340 plus type bull. And finally, I'm gonna go ahead and select the state of Colorado. I'm gonna hit search, and that results in 10 separate results of hunts that could that meet my criteria. Now, it doesn't take me very long to look at this and see units like 201, 10, 2, all of which take well over 20 points to draw. I'm never gonna catch those. So I'm gonna scroll through these, and I have already picked my unit. It's gonna be unit 76. Now, when I click item details on that, I get a lot of great data from Hunt and Fool. We've amassed this data based on research with wildlife biologists, communication with outfitters and guides, uh, previous members who have hunted the unit, etc. And in this particular case, Hunt and Fool believes that there's an opportunity at up to a 345 type bull. Uh, that's gonna take a little bit of luck and a hard hunt because for the most part, we rank this unit as a 300 to 320 hunt. But more important to me is the fact that this is part of the Wimanooch Wilderness Area and it's got tons of wilderness, tons of US Forest Service. I'm not gonna be hunting around the perimeter of somebody's private land trying to kill a big bull. I'm gonna get to get lost in the woods, in the back country the way that I like to hunt elk. So all of this detail is uh, captured for each hunt that meets the criteria once your filters are ran. It's a super handy tool. Like I said, I've already chosen Colorado Unit 76. And before the haters start hating on me for giving away secret spots, because I am going to be very specific in this video, I'm gonna show drainages, I'm gonna show mountains, I'm gonna show an e-scouting plan that I have been putting together that's legit because I do indeed plan to hunt this. It's also important to note, I have I don't have any tips. Nobody has told me any of these locations or anything else. I've known for almost 20 years that this unit is a good unit in Colorado. I've wanted to hunt it. So outside of that, everything that I've amassed today in today's video has come about as a result of that 13 years of e-scouting experience that I've had in the past.
Now for me personally, step two of every virtual hunt plan process is centered around habitat. I want to focus on water, food, bedding, topography, escapement, all those kinds of things that make elk habitat useful for elk. Um, now in this particular case, I'm going to be focusing on a high country unit in Colorado, so food is going to be my top priority. If I were hunting a unit in southern New Mexico, I would probably make water my number one priority. Either way, I'm going to start using the Hunt and Fool mapping platform to identify these sources. And so as we dive into step two, looking at habitat, the first thing I'm going to do is turn on our fire layer, which has a feature to it that to my knowledge, no other uh, mapping platform offers. Before we dive into the fire layer, I'm actually going to go into my layer menu and I'm going to select hunting data and the state of Colorado and I'm going to turn on all of the GMUs. This will give me every game management unit for deer and elk in the state of Colorado. With those on, I can now zoom in to my particular unit. Again, I'm looking at unit 76 here in Colorado, specifically the southern portion of it. and. Now I'm going to go into the land boundary data tab and that tab includes government land ownership, wilderness, roadless areas, fire, basically anything that can kind of cover the, the uh, portion of the map you're looking at with a layer is under this land, land boundary data tab. I'm going to turn on wildfire history and I'd like to show you something that is again unique to the Hunt and Fool map and an awesome tool. If I zoom back out here a little bit, you'll see that the whole U.S. is covered in a little Christmas tree colored uh, array of wildfires. We have color coded our wildfires by year, which is super beneficial because a 20 year old fire is not going to do near as much good in your research probably as a five to 10 year old fire would. So in this particular case, as I zoom back into unit 76, I see that there's a big fire complex that happened in, in 2013. It's going to provide a ton of feed. It's a seven year old burn should be phenomenal habitat for elk at this point in time. Another great feature on that fire layer and almost every other layer on the Hunt and Fool mapping platform is the ability to use transparencies. So we have sliders that you can adjust the opacity of your layer, the overlay, up and down. Now I want to be able to kind of see through this fire layer so I'm going to turn the opacity down and that way I can see the topography and the vegetation that's actually underneath the fire. Super important feature to have and almost every layer in the Hunt and Fool map provides these transparency layers. So I've identified some really awesome looking feed but I also want to look at topography and cover and escapement as well. So I'm going to use some other layers in the map that enable me to do that. One thing before I move off of feed I always look for on every e-scouting trip I do is agriculture. Elk will hike miles and miles to visit an alfalfa field um, even if it's way out in the sage. So I always look for agriculture. I always look for burns and then of course I'm always looking for natural food sources like meadows and sagebrush parks and other places where elk will feed regularly. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the wildfire layer so that I can turn on one of our mini topographical layers. If you go into the base map feature of the Hunt and Fool map, you'll find that we have four different USA Topo base layers. One of which is a really cool map that has uh, satellite imagery that has topographical lines superimposed over it makes it easy to kind of see what the topography looks like while really not compromising your view to the terrain and vegetation at all. But in this particular case, I'm going to use the original USGS topo layer. I like this map a lot because it provides more data than almost any others do. It has old spring names and tank names and uh, roads that are no longer in existence but don't show up on other maps but they do here. Might be easier places for me to pack or access, right? So what I'm looking for when it comes to elk habitat is a lot of nice benches with a lot of moisture, places that there's water and feed, saddles, etc. Now it doesn't take long at all to look at this particular area that I'm e-scouting. I've got swamps like right here in these locations, uh, tons of water. I've got really nice flat topographical lines, so good benches, uh, good bedding areas, etc. So the final step for me is to determine if it has, you know, why I'm looking in burns. So I want to make sure that it burned in what's called a mosaic pattern. So basically I need to make sure that there's still timber there so that they'll have a place to bed and get out of the heat. And as I turn off the topographical layer, you can see that there, there is a lot of timber left in and around these burns. So lots of places for the elk to get away from the crowd and get some bedding cover.
once I've identified the unit that I want to hunt and then I've identified some great habitat inside that unit, the next most important thing to me is to identify access. And the access piece is probably the most complicated because there's not any single one source that provides all the answers that you need. Hunt and Fools mapping platform, we are working that direction, but for right now you're going to need to use a few different tools. To arrive at the access locations I have in this e-scouting session, I used the Hunt and Fool mapping platform, including our roads and trails layer that I'll show you here in a minute. I also used Google Earth because there was a little bit clearer imagery in a few spots that I wanted to see if it actually looked like a two track or if it was a single track trail. And then finally, and most importantly, I used free sources from the USDA Forest Service websites where you're gonna need to look for motor vehicle usage maps, MVUMs. Now these are super critical because this is the most current travel plan that the individual district inside of that national forest has established as what is legal and what is not. And I have been on hunts where I have shown up with a backpack on a trail that had four-wheeler and motorcycle traffic going up and down it and wanted to just kick my own butt. I have also shown up at trailheads that I or tried to drive to trailheads that I thought were miles beyond where the road was actually blocked, whether that be due to private property or to a new closure, erosion, fire, you name it. So it becomes extremely crucial to use this free resource from the National Forest Sites to truly identify your access plan. And in doing so, I've created a whole bunch of waypoints that I've already added into the map that took me literally probably six to eight hours just to put this handful of waypoints in. The first layer in the Hunt and Fool map that I like to use when it comes to identifying vehicle access points is our roadless layer. So I'm going to go back into the layer menu, I'm going to open land boundary data, and turn on the roadless area layer. And as you can see, this clouds, it puts a cloud over all the area that does not have motor vehicle access according to the map. And again, you've got to check multiple resources to verify this. But as you can see in my particular area, it has large sections that are clouded as well as small sections that are clearly travel routes of some kind that allow motorized access. So I actually pair this layer with the wilderness layer as well because I happen to know that in wilderness you have different travel restrictions than you might have in other roadless areas. For example in wilderness you can't use any wheeled vehicle even if it's a pedal bike or a wheelbarrow or a game cart off limits. So I like to have the wilderness area and the roadless area kind of clouded over each other to understand that most of my access is going to be around the edge of this. And as you can see from my waypoints that are marked with the ATV symbol, all of them are essentially like here, here, here. All of these are essentially right alongside the edge of the roadless and or wilderness area. So this was my first head start to identify, all right, where does it look like I can drive to uh, to start my backpack trips? Now, another great tool that I used was our roads and trails layer. This is a national forest roads and trail layer that is a live feed from the USDA National Forest Service. So it should, for the most part, represent where you can and can't drive. Again, it's not 100% accurate, uh, I don't think the government does a great job of keeping up with it. So this is where you need to do your own research and make sure you don't make a mistake. But as you can see, when I turn that on, most of my little ATV symbols are parked neatly at the end of these little access routes. So for the most part, these things were true. Now I have two that I need to check on. One over here in space that you can see does not have a road coming up to it. And then another one that is parked here in the middle of an open space and a road does come into it, but it doesn't appear that it should end because it continues to say that it's a national forest road beyond it. So that's where I went to the USDA Forest Service site and downloaded a map that clearly showed that that route ended there. So now I was curious, I turned on another land boundary data layer, which is the government land ownership layer. This is when all, it all became very clear to me that in both cases where I was questioning whether or not the road continued on, that road went through private land. And probably at one point in time, there was an easement through that private land and it was no big deal. But in recent years, uh, wealthy landowners have bought up a lot of these remote 
private properties and tried uh, legal means to shut down access. And it's kind of a sad deal, but the reality is um, had, I just, had I relied strictly on Google Earth and uh, another mapping platform that we use here, the Esri platform, I would have thought that I could have gotten at least eight miles further in on that road and would not have noticed that I was uh, going to be in bad shape if I tried to take that route. So again, I just want to illustrate the importance of making sure that all of your access points are verified against every potential source that you can. And then you go ahead and mark those so that you can start making your travel plan from there. All right, so for me, step four is to identify glassing and listening points on any elk hunt. And keep in mind that I've already picked my unit. I have identified quality habitat inside of the unit, and I have mapped out my nearest access points in an effort to make sure that I don't burn up boot leather where I don't need to. So finally, when we move into glassing and listening points, the reason I bring that in after access is because I would much rather cover ground with my glass than with my boots on an elk hunt just to make the most of my precious time in the field. So if I know where access points are quite frequently, I can find a glassing point that is closer to the access point, closer to vehicle access than it is to boot access. And so I will rely first and foremost on those glassing points where I can drive to within a reasonable distance, maybe even be able to glass from the truck. Keep in mind with today's optics, you can glass for miles and miles and miles and identify at least elk, if not actually put together a decent idea for how big of a bull you're looking at. But bottom line is, Glassing points come after my vehicle access plan for a reason, and it's because I'd rather get close with the vehicle, do shorter trips with the glass, and burn up elk habitat through the lens instead of on my boot leather. All right, I'll take a quick minute to illustrate a few of the glassing points that I found for this particular hunt because they are adjacent to a road, but they provide me an opportunity to glass a vast amount of roadless area. So one of the key glassing points I've identified is right over here on a little ridge that allows me the opportunity to see miles of habitat, prime elk habitat from one particular glassing location that includes burns, uh, bedding areas, swamps, ponds, just all kinds of ideal elk habitat. So those are the kind of places that if I can walk less than a mile and cover six plus miles worth of habitat from one glassing point, that's going to be my top priority when I get in there to start looking for that bull I really want to find for this false hunt. Now, another great glassing point that I found that fit the same bill involves about a 700 vertical foot hike right from the edge of the road that puts me at the top of a very tall peak that enables me to glass behind a big chunk of private property, an entire basin, and then all the way to the head of a beautiful elky looking draw that has a ton of great looking habitat in it. Again, I'll be able to drive right up to the base of this knob, grab my tripod and optics, do a six, 700 vertical foot hike and have an opportunity to see hundreds of thousands of acres of prime elk habitat that if I just relied on my boots alone to get to, I wouldn't be able to cover in a two week season. Now I've spent quite a bit of time talking about it strictly from the glassing point of view, but it's equally as important to note that elk can be heard for a mile or more on clear nights uh, and clear days with little wind. So these points are just as important to be able to hear elk as it is to be able to see elk. Sometimes no matter how good your glassing vista is, you can't turn up a batch of elk. Even on a, I've had it even on open hillsides where I've thought, man, I know I should be able to see that bull, but I can hear him sounding off. So it's equally as important to think about your elk hunt from a glassing and listening point of view of you, particularly when you're talking about rut hunts with a bow. The fifth and final thing that I think about for every single virtual hunt plan that I put together is my personal impact on the elk hunting area. And this is going to consist of how do I get in and out with disturbing the least amount of elk? And if I'm going to camp in there, where can I camp that's the least likely to disturb elk so that I don't become my own worst enemy on one of these hunts? It's a super important part of the entire e-scouting platform. And it's often overlooked because people tend to camp in beautiful meadows next to elk grubs and wallows. And, and I have seen hundreds and hundreds of scenarios where people become their own worst enemy 
spook their own elk off and have to relocate because they've ruined the hunt. So we're gonna walk through that personal impact plan and how I go about accessing the areas that I'm gonna uh, hunt and also how I go about selecting a campsite. The first thing to think about when it comes to your personal impact on the elk hunting area is what time of day should I go in? Now, if you're day hunting in an area, this is sort of irrelevant. You gotta go in before daylight and come out after dark every night. But if you're gonna bivy in somewhere, the temptation is to leave at three o'clock in the morning and get in there and get, a, you know, I'm all excited, I wanna go hunting. And there are certain scenarios that still mandate that just maybe because there's just too many miles to cover in a reasonable period of time. But if I have the opportunity to go in in late morning, that's what I'll usually do. I'll wait until the cool night air has stopped cascading down and casting my scent all down below me and that that warmer air is starting to replace it and starting to rise. It'll just leave me a smaller overall footprint of scent in the area that I'm gonna go in. Plus, if I go in in the dark, I don't have the benefit of being able to glass and see elk and avoid you know, a potential herd of elk that I might run out of my own hunting area. Um, you know, one thing to think about in that scenario too, if you're going in in the dark and you're grading across the big basin and there's elk below you, again, your scent is clamped to the ground, it's being pushed down the hill, at an incredible rate in these high mountains usually. And honestly, if they're not talking, you don't know that. And you can literally walk across and evacuate a whole basin of elk unbeknownst to you. So if you can, it's always a good idea to head in once those thermals have switched and you're gonna make a smaller overall impact on your access point. Now for this particular hunt scouting platform, I've actually found an ideal campsite that's based on the most important attribute that I find when I'm selecting campsites on bivy hunts. And that is I wanna be camped off of all the flat, nice areas where the elk are gonna rut and bed and feed. And I wanna be on the steepest slope that I can possibly find that provides a flat enough spot to to uh, set up a tent. So I have actually found a really ideal little bench in this particular hunt scouting package that has thick timber on it. So it's gonna help muffle noise, hide my tent, all that kind of stuff. But more importantly, it's got a giant wash almost completely cutting off any elk that would incidentally come around over underneath my tent. So it's protected by this super steep uh, wash and it's protected by steep habitat that's just not ideal for elk anyway. So for the most part, there's some natural barriers that are gonna keep elk from unintentionally bumping into my scent trail in the middle of the night. The other thing I love about this location is that I'm about 500 vertical feet from an incredible 360 degree listening and glassing point that provides me access to hear and see into some of the best elk habitat in the area that I have. So not only am I gonna live small on this little bench off the steep face, but I'm also gonna be able to quickly and easily get to a location where I can hear and see on a regular basis to start my elk hunt each day. So in summary, when it comes time to develop your personal impact plan, I can't stress enough how important it is to do it digitally first, then to stick to it, have the self-discipline to stick to it, because it's only gonna pay dividends to you in the field. It's just gonna extend the quality time that you have to hunt elk on any given hunt. So have the self-discipline when you're hungry, tired, thirsty, um, and it will pay great dividends in the elk woods for you. So to wrap up our e-scouting 101 to develop your virtual hunt plans, we're gonna start with unit selection and you wanna use every tool that you can, including the free tools and paid tools like Hunt and Fool. Then you're gonna to wanna to identify the habitat, including feed, water, cover, you name it. You're gonna to wanna to spend a lot of time on access, particularly using all the resources available so that you don't wind up backpacking down a four-wheeler trail. Then you're gonna to wanna to look at glassing and listening points, and I highly recommend starting from those that are the easiest to access first and work your way in so that you can cover more ground with your eyes and glass than with your boots. And then finally, when it's time to go hunting, when it's time to backpack in there or to day hunt, think about your personal impact plan. Think about how you're gonna get in and out without ruining your own hunt and becoming your own worst enemy. Hope this helps you out. Uh, if you like our content, give us a thumbs up. We really appreciate that. It helps us out a lot. And we're looking forward to having lots of submissions from successful hunters this fall.